Hey guys, welcome back to Elmer Racing. Uh, in this video we're looking at our Rex engine and how we optimize that for uh, inlet restrictor uh, type uh, maximum performance. And uh, yeah, the engine has now been uh, chassis dynoed and track testing or uh, track tested uh, in our customers uh, rallycross car. And uh, yeah, it hasn't been on the engine dyno so we don't have uh, uh, absolute horsepower numbers from the engine but we do have some uh, yeah, really good uh, performance data and we're going to be going through that but uh yeah let's uh, look at how the engine dyno stuff works or uh, sorry chassis dyno stuff works so yeah let's trap it down on a wheel dyno of course losses will vary greatly depending on the dyno and stuff like this and even how you strap down the car so this is why you can compare uh, absolute uh, engine numbers This is how we do over and over again and uh, just sitting so so far so good and we have of course well i mean by we i mean our customer and we've just been there to help them so track testing of course also and on the track that's where the car actually has to perform so all the air fuel ratios have to be correct uh, and uh yeah temperature control stuff like this just so listening here of course you have a quite significant doppler effect there when the uh, car is accelerating straight towards you and the microphone isn't the best for this type of a situation but you can just barely hear hear there that the uh, in the upshift the engine rpm just drops there's no popping no banging or anything like that so uh, that part of the uh, ecu setup is very very good and uh, yeah you of course want to check how the engine performs in dynamic situations so when you go at uh, lower rpm and how the anti-lag stuff works with different throttle openings and what your egt's are going to be in the actual uh, like uh, track racing situations and just the launch control stuff and all of this needs actually to be done uh, to do that on a chassis dyno so uh, yeah let's uh, start looking at the sort of basis behind a uh, restrictor plate engine and what kind of solutions we've done on our rex engine to maximize performance so let's through, go through the basics of engine performance first of course you want to ingest as much air as possible and uh, keep that in the cylinder so you can mix the maximum amount of fuel to, to that and then you want to burn it as efficiently as possible to get the maximum amount of uh, pressure rise on top of the piston and uh, yeah that's basically the amount of power you're producing and then after that you want to uh, minimize the losses so that you're losing as little of that power as possible through the different uh, stages or the other stages in the engine and to fix friction losses and stuff like this and uh, that will maximize your power so let's uh, first look at the most important thing which is how much air you can ingest through the engine so with a restrictor plate engine so this will depend slightly on uh, what type of a uh, uh, restrictor uh, regulations you have but for the FIA rallycross stuff um, you have the inlet restrictor before a turbocharger and typically if you can set up this like efficiently enough which isn't really very difficult uh, you will be able to run this the the airflow through that restrictor at the choke limit and when uh, you do that you typically have a, a curve like this so so here you have um, ambient sea level pressure that, that we have here at low altitudes is around 101 kPa something like this I can't don't remember the exact value but something like this so this like sharply sharply curves off this is just like a linear <laughs> interpolation so not like a curve fit which you what you actually would want here but yeah <laughs> I'm too bad at these programs to make that happen but yeah if you're at ambient pressure so this is the uh, pressure at the uh, choke point in, in the restrictor and uh, yeah, if you're at ambient pressure, you have zero flow, of course, because there's no pressure difference from the ambient air. Then when you start uh, pulling more vacuum, so when you're down to, well, let's yeah, look at this the different way. So when you're at maximum uh, under pressure, so that's about 53.6 kPa, something like this at the uh, pressure where we have here. This will vary by temperature also somewhat. Uh, but uh, yeah, in these conditions, some, somewhere around that. And this is the absolute limit, so it's not possible to get the uh, the choke pressure lower than about 53.6 kPa and this is only a function of the air that is being ingested so there's no uh, the turbocharger or the engine or anything like that does not influence this at all this is purely a, a air um, sort of air physics thing 
Um, this amount of air you can get through that will vary slightly, so depending on how efficient your uh, restrictor geometry is, so so how narrow of a boundary layer you can manage to get at that uh, thinnest choke point. The thinner the boundary layer, the more sort of, of that uh, diameter that you can efficiently use to flow air. But these will typically be very small if you have a reasonably designed uh, uh, shaped sort of a, uh, in inlet uh, to that restrictor. So. But yeah, you could maybe gain half a percent, something like this, and uh, these are the types of percentages you're really looking at when you want to optimize these engines. So you really, really want to optimize this because, yeah, that will gain you a slight advantage. But uh, yeah, we can see here if we go down to about uh, 60 kPa, we're losing about 1% of mass flow. Uh, when we go down to about, this was about 72 kPa, something like this, uh, then we're losing about 10% mass flow, so theoretically 10% engine power. Of course, pumping losses also go down a little bit, so it's not directly this, but but in the ballpark. And yeah, when you're around uh, 90 kPa, something like this, uh, you're losing about 30% power. So, so yeah, you typically want to be at least below 60 kPa, but preferably like within 1 kPa from the from the absolute limit. And if you're really really fine tuning for for maximum performance, you want to be absolutely on the uh, choke limit. Uh, at the, all feasible times. Um, yeah, so this is the uh, amount of air you can get into the engine. And uh, yeah, let's look at some comparisons. So this is not the uh, newest values, uh, but from a, a dyno pool, uh, again, on a chassis, so, or, or chassis dyno. Uh, so, so this uh, yellow line, line here is the uh, turbocharger choke, choke pressure. So at the restrictor actually before the turbocharger uh, compressor. And uh, yeah, here you can see a straight line here. So we're basically on the limit here. Uh, so this is from a yeah, slightly censored uh, dyno map. So I'm not showing any RPM or anything like that. But here you can see in this area where we're on the choke limit. And then at this higher RPM where uh, yeah, the choke, we're getting further away from the uh, choke limit and we're going yeah, way above 60 kPa. So we're losing much more than 1%, probably around closer to even 2% power or something like this. So this is a really significant margin here. And this is the turbocharger RPM here. So you can see that the turbocharger RPM is dropping at the same point. So um, yeah, clearly, I mean, there's either boost pressure control, which is kind of difficult to do with this type of a choke limit. So you uh, re uh, really would want to do a turbocharger RPM based, based uh, target map for this. And uh, yeah, adjusting this correctly, you can uh, keep the flow the flow amount high enough so that you're actually on the choke limit all the time. And here at lower RPM, you can clearly see that yeah, we're basically steady on the uh, airflow amount here. So yeah, potentially you could increase boost pressure and get it to flow more. Uh, here we're starting to uh, engine RPM is increasing, and we're starting to hit a limit here on the uh, boost pressure target also. So another step here, and and uh, yeah, from here you can see we're about at 74 kPa, so we're losing over 10% uh, power here in this area. And yeah, the uh, sort of carefully reducing this, and yeah, this is also mainly to uh, save the gearbox and drivetrain as much as possible, because at the lower the RPM, uh, you're running maximum flow through the engine, then uh, basically as long as you don't need to retard timing way too much, you're making uh, much more uh, torque for the same engine power. And yeah, that it, has a higher load on all the gearing and stuff like this in the gearbox. So uh, yeah, you don't really necessarily want to do that un unless you really need the sort of width of the power band. But uh, yeah, it's definitely possible to do. Um, what is next? Uh, yeah, uh, let's look at the uh, sort of engine strokes and the uh, losses next. So the engine will make power primarily from the uh, power strokes. So that's when you're combusting uh, your air fuel mixture in the cylinder and the uh, piston is moving downward so the high pressure there is, is pressing down the piston and you are uh, making power and the amount of power you can do with this is basically what kind of a, a trapped amount of uh, fresh air and fuel you have in the cylinder so how much you can burn and by that increase temperature and pressure uh, in the cylinder and then um, so efficiently efficiency wise also uh, you want to have the uh, higher compression ratio the better uh, so this will uh, will have uh, will give you a higher expansion ratio and this is really uh, basically so kind of naively thinking of the situation this will allow a, a lower exhaust gas temperature the more you can expand the gases in the cylinder and that basically means less wasted 
uh, exhaust gas heat. So if you kind of want to look at it in this sort of um, thermodynamic, non-physical way, then then uh, that's a sort of easy easy way to think about it. You're losing less energy out the exhaust, so that means the more energy is more energy is going into the piston. Um, then you also want to look at combustion efficiency because this is something that is not really very difficult to achieve a good combustion efficiency, but that depends kind of heavily on how the engine is built. So with our, our Rex engine that is designed for, well, our Thor engine also. So so this is basically our the Rex engine we're talking about now, and this is our Thor engine. So a slight sort of smaller brother. Uh, but both of those engines are designed uh, to be able to uh, run modern anti-lag stuff. So, so that means cylinder cuts, basically. And to be able to do that um, as efficiently as with, uh, and with as uh, high reliability as possible, uh, you want to be able to cut fueling from one cycle from a cylinder and bring that cylinder back the next stroke immediately at up to full power. So that basically means you want to reduce the amount of wall wetting as much as possible uh, from the fuel injection, of course. Uh, in, in the uh, inlet ducts and on the back of the valve and stuff like this. Now this implies some kind of some restrictions to where you can place the injectors, what kind of uh, pressures you want to run and, and stuff like this and this uh, can very significantly affect what kind of uh, uh, air fuel mix quality you have in your inlet charge in the cylinder and uh, how well that will, will burn. So um, yeah for instance um, when we were uh, helping out our customer here with uh, this engine on the chassis dyno we were looking at what kind of theoretical values they were running and stuff like this, so we recommended them to bump up the uh, fuel pressure to the uh, maximum that we can get out of the uh, fuel pump they were using, and look at the uh, timing for the for the injector uh, pulse to work optimally, and that that gained us the uh, reduction of 20% in fuel consumption, and uh, we got around 15 horsepower uh, additional power. But yeah, the power amount is kind of wishy-washy on a, on a chassis dyno at, at these small amounts. I mean, even consecutive pulls are like, yeah, you can't say if it's like 13 horsepower or 15 horsepower. That's completely impossible. And even like five horsepower differences are kind of difficult to see. So all of this is a little bit wishy-washy, but, but um, yeah, in, in this range. And these are the kind of, um, yeah, so they're not huge numbers. But again, when we're looking at, at trying to gain like 1% or something, so this is in like 2% or something like this. So th these are like significant numbers in this sort of a scope of things. So let's talk about the pumping power or uh, pumping losses or something like this, depending on what kind of literature or, or programs you're looking into. Uh, so this is basically the uh, uh, combined exhaust stroke and intake stroke and how much uh, power loss there typically will be with that. So, so if you have a higher sort of integral of the uh, cylinder pressure over the exhaust stroke than what you have on the intake stroke that means you're you're losing power uh, so that would be a pumping loss then but on turbocharged cars um, it is very possible to have a higher boost pressure than exhaust pressure uh, especially in racing engines uh, re with restrictor engines it's slightly more difficult because you lose so much more so much efficiency on the on the compressor section with that that you need to run uh, more energy through the turbo with to the turbine section which means uh, a comparatively uh, higher back uh, back pressure so exhaust manifold pressure uh, but um yeah you can it's definitely possible to have like a positive ratio and depending on how well uh, your intake uh, exhaust flows and how well the cylinder head flows and your valve timing and stuff like this so you are always going to have um, flow losses in the system also so the it's not just the intake to uh, exhaust manifold pressure difference that you're looking at, but what kind of pressure you have in cylinder. Um, so uh, other things that will affect this, yeah, so definitely engine tuning. So what kind of uh, ducting lengths you have, how the, those are tuned for the uh, engine RPM range, uh, how this works with the valve timing. Um, and also, of course, uh, turbo selection is very, very important. So you always want to run the maximum size turbine possible and by size I mean sort of flow amount it's I mean yeah depending on how well it's designed you can have like a smaller size like physically sized turbine that flows more and then of course that's equivalent to something else depending again on their efficiency of course also um, yeah and something to take into account also with with this um, exhaust and intake stroke is what kind of trapping efficiency you have so especially on restricted engines uh, when you're limited to the amount of airflow you can get in or mass flow that you can get in 
You want to trap as much of that as possible in the cylinder so you can actually burn that and produce power. But on the flip side of that, um, you have the scavenging efficiency, so how much you can remove exhaust gas from the cylinder, because with the, like this is like an in-cylinder EGR effect. So, so if you have external EGR, you can cool the gases and that will not be as bad for the engine. Uh, you can even like significantly increase efficiency, so, so that's potentially a good thing. But in-cylinder EGR, especially at high loads, is very, very bad because you will have high temperature exhaust gases in the cylinder. Of course, these are already burnt, so they won't like, like um, create knock by itself. But because they are increasing the uh, temperature of the, the, of the charge in the cylinder, this is bad for, for your knock limit. So you need to ex exhaust as much um, like burnt combustion gases as possible from the cylinder. Um, so let's look at, at the uh, yeah, inlet and exhaust manifold uh, pressures from our REX engine. So this is, yeah, again, heavily censored, so <laughs> no absolute numbers or anything like that, but I can show you the basics of, of what we have. So the inlet pressure uh, is this um, purple, whatever this, <laughs> this color is called, uh, line here. And the exhaust pressure here. So the inlet pressure is is smooth because this is a uh, input value for the ECU. So that's that's why it's much smoother than the exhaust pressure. And, and the exhaust pressure is just like a raw input value. Um, so yeah, you can see at so again this is like a ramp run from a chassis dyno. So the, we have lower RPM here, higher RPM here, and I believe we're reaching the uh, choke limit on the uh, inlet restrictor around these kind of points here somewhere. So you can see that we're maintaining a positive pressure ratio basically even at the uh, limit of the inlet restrictor, which is a huge achievement. And typically this would would um, require you to to run like like in old design sort of stuff, this would require you to run such a large turbine section that you would be losing a huge amount of uh, potential like response time and, and uh, performance at lower engine RPM. But we've managed to to get this working. I mean, you can probably figure out what we've done to help the situation a little bit from our other videos, but I'm not going to go into details here, but we have a solution to help significantly with that. And uh, yeah, you can see here at uh, lower RPM, we have a, a big pressure difference. So we have a much higher inlet manifold pressure than exhaust manifold pressure. This of course creates some blow by it, but also, uh, so again, we're losing some uh, inlet air going straight out the exhaust manifold and not uh, com like, contributing to power in the cylinder. But since we're not at the uh, mass flow lim limit on the restrictor, this isn't really a problem either. So we're increasing the volumetric efficiency at lower, at sort of lower boost levels at lower RPM. And so, I mean, lower than what we could theoretically maximum run. And this is kind of useful because yeah, that also again helps, helps with, with the scavenging efficiency so we can uh, remove as much exhaust gas from the cylinder as possible and by that uh, sort of raise the knock limit so that we can run more ignition advanced and have a more efficient engine at, at higher boost pressure at lower RPM. So then we have one uh, stroke left in, in the cycle that we haven't talked about yet, that's the compression stroke. Now this is um, yeah something that, that isn't really something that, that in these type of race engines you will be discussing a lot. I mean, you can make a non-symmetrical uh, engines either mechanically with with a very complicated setups that typically will increase your friction losses more than they're worth uh, in the gains or you can run uh, valve timings that sort of reduce your VE uh, on purpose to uh, get sort of a, a lower uh, compression cycle compared to your expansion uh, cycle and in, in this way sort of increase efficiency. Uh, but in this type of engine you, I mean you will be running very close to symmetrical so your compression losses will, will just be based on what your sort of trapped amount of, of stuff is in the cylinder when the intake valve closes and what your compression ratio is. So b increasing your compression ratio will, will increase losses here, but you will get larger gains on the power stroke. So you want to run the maximum amount of compression ratio basically. Okay, so let's get into losses. Uh, the coolant system losses is one of the uh, more sort of significant engine design criteria. So you want to, of course, reduce the amount of, of uh, energy you're putting into the coolant as much as possible. Even if this doesn't necessarily increase your efficiency as much, I mean, there is a positive benefit, but typically if you reduce the coolant requirements, then it will just be increasing your exhaust gas temperature, but gaining a slight amount of engine power, but it's very small. But so there, there is still a gain there. So you want to, to keep basically the uh, combustion chamber volume as small as possible. 
So uh, having a, as few like these uh, corners as possible, so they, they increase surface area. And you want to reduce surface area to get a, a less amount of uh, heat, heat transfer to the cooling system. But you also need to be very careful about uh, how you uh, cool your different areas, like your areas around the exhaust valve, you need to cool these. Yep, sorry. Yeah, you need to cool the uh, spark plugs also, uh, the exhaust ducting area. So these are the most significant areas you, you need to look at. And it's quite a challenge to do that, especially because you don't want to like overcool some areas and get like uh, high temperature differences or high like temperature gradients because this isn't not very good for for the engine material depending on what kind of a of a material you're using um, but yeah as far as i know we're still the only company that has a, a billet four valve uh, circuit racing capable uh, engine that i mean has cooling for sort of sustained maximum power output so so we're really happy about the, that and i'm not going to go into uh, too much detail about our cooling system because of this also so trying to uh, keep some cards to ourselves uh, did I forget anything about that here? Oh uh, yeah, so uh, cooling the surfaces and especially uh, the exhaust valves and stuff like this is uh, also just to prevent them from melting but also uh, to keep the knock sort of um, threshold lower. So the higher the uh, surface temperatures you have and the, uh, the sort of sharper edges will create higher temperature points there. So you want to keep those as cool as possible to uh, reduce knocking effect and if you have high enough temperatures there you can even get like uh, pre-ignition stuff so so it's something that is really important to get uh, right for for the engine setup then one significant uh, part of losses also is uh, friction losses and this will typically um, yeah rise significantly with with uh, engine rpm so you need to take this into consideration also like how important friction losses are for your engine will depend on how high in the rpm range you're, you're operating in uh, so if we start looking at the engine, basically we'd yeah, maybe start at the valve train. So on our Rex engine we have uh, bucket um, sort of lifters. This is not really ideal uh, performance-wise, but to uh, keep the budget low enough to be able to produce this type of a, of a very high performance and, and high strength and durability, uh, complete billet racing engine, the bucket seats are really the, the best way to go. But, I mean, there could be sort of around a 5 to 10 percent, uh, or sorry, a 5 to 10 horsepower sort of um, friction loss there by really heavily optimizing the valve train. So running as uh, soft valve springs as possible and uh, roller rocker setups, of course, this again limits your maximum RPM that you can run at because the roller rockers will have a higher inertia than, well, you can have like non-roller rockers, which is the lowest amount of inertia possible. But uh, yeah, this again would, would require higher, higher RPM than what we're using currently. So I think the bucket lifter w lifters uh, we're currently using are kind of a good compromise. But we do have significantly, I mean, very, very stiff valve springs, especially for initial uh, engine tuning and stuff like this, when you might encounter misfires because yeah, your charge time on the coils might need to be larger or you might need to reduce your uh, spark plug gap or something like this. So. You don't want the engine to immediately blow up on the first misfire or ignition cut or something like this so something to take into consideration uh, then we have the uh, yeah crankshaft bearings connecting rod bearings uh, the uh, pistons and uh, piston rings so with this type of a uh, of a uh, circuit uh, racing use that is well or, or rally cross use that is uh, limited by the rules significantly so we're limited on the size of bearings we can run so that basically dictates how much friction loss we have from those uh, but piston rings are something that that we can influence and this is yeah typically if you have a uh, need 10 newton meters or 20 newton meters of of uh, torque on the crankshaft when you're road heading on the bench this will typically scale linearly with rpm so you still need the extra 20 newtons or something whatever that that might be at higher rpm also so you're losing more power at higher rpm the uh, stiffer your your valve springs are but this is again a trade-off because if you run two soft valve springs then you will have a significant like uh, oil seepage past the rings into the combustion chamber and this will create uh, yeah knock issues and stuff like this because uh, yeah engine oil does not have a very high high octane number um yeah let's look at how to sort of evaluate what kind of a friction sort of loss amount you have in your engine because how would you even be capable of measuring this but i think we have a solution for that so um let's go over here 
So this is uh, engine oil temperature here, and again, this is censored all the uh, values here, so don't get too carried away. Uh, but our engine oil temperature stable here and stable here. Uh, so this uh, this is over a relatively short period of time. We have a uh, two. So these are engine RPM uh, plots. So two two pulls. And basically, uh, calculating the amount of engine oil we have in the system uh, and what that heat capacity is, we can figure out how much energy uh, is required to bring the engine oil temperature up by this x amount. And uh, we know what, like, see what kind of a, a width these these pools are at at the higher RPM ranges. And since these are stable, we can basically assume that all of this heating is from from these short time periods. And for that we can calculate what the friction losses are, because I mean, again, well the components can internally heat up also, so it's not like absolute value, but a very, very good estimate. And uh, yeah, with this we can see like, is the friction sort of amount, because I mean, again, these components need to be cooled, because otherwise they will just heat, uh, heat up and heat up and melt and the engine will destroy itself. So they're all being cooled by the engine oil, and that's why we can measure it through uh, engine oil temperature rise. And uh, yeah, I'm not going to give any absolute numbers, but we do have very, very good uh, friction losses from this. So, so by that, I mean, yeah, very, very reasonable friction losses. So very happy about that. Um, yeah, other things that are typically um, uh, clumped into friction losses is like auxiliary uh, power unit losses. So the oil pump typically can't really be calculated that because, or included in that. I mean, that's more of a friction loss of the actual engine. Uh, because yeah, you you need to have that running for the engine to work at all. But other auxiliaries like uh, alternators and uh, hydraulic uh, power steering pumps, uh, like on this um, Rex engine that the uh, customer asked us to supply mounting points for, um, these are kind of pluses and minuses. So it's of course when you're testing and and doing this, it's very beneficial to have these because you don't need to charge the the battery all the time or anything like that. But for uh, high performance racing use in a series with with a relatively high minimum weight limit you can run a large uh, battery instead and run uh, basically a electric uh, driven hydraulic power steering pump or direct electric uh, power steering and then you of course won't need the alternator either if you have a large enough battery so that you can just run on battery power for the entire four lap heat or or a six lap final or something like this in rallycross so so definitely something that the uh, top teams are doing and for for like actual performance use we would definitely recommend that to to run without the the uh, multi-v belt at all and without the alternator and the uh, power steering pump we've now uh, gone through how to make maximum power and how to reduce power losses but in addition to the uh, maximum power value you will of course need some some type of power band and in this type of racing, you also need like overrun and underrun areas also as wide as possible from the actual power band. Uh, so the power band width you need will be de determined on, on what kind of gearing you're running and how close that will, like the gear shifts, like how much the RPM drops during uh, shifting to the next gear. Um, so this can actually be relatively narrow in, with a rallycross engine. So we're making a max power with this engine around 6,500, 7,000 RPM, something like this. And um, the uh, power band width sort of is around 5,000, 5,500 RPM to about 7,500, something like this. And this is, I mean, more than wide enough for upshift, so you can run it at, at like maximum power uh, on the straights and accelerating out of corners and stuff like this. But in addition to this, uh, I mean, things break all the time and there are, yeah, issues and stuff you need to both go up in RPM range so our engine is designed to utilize the maximum 9500 RPM that the FIA uh, supercar rally uh, su supercar rally cross uh, custom engine rules uh, allow for and then we also and I mean maintain a relatively good efficiency so that you're not losing too much power when you go up past the uh, peak uh, peak sort of engine performance RPM upwards in addition to that, you need a lower RPM range also, and this is very important actually, because when you're braking on loose surfaces, uh, you like optimum braking performance will be when you have a significant sort of a wheel slip or, or like wheel lockup percentage. So you might be locking up like 50% or 30% or something like this. So, so if your vehicle speed like dictates that you're at like 
whatever, 7,000 RPM, and with 50% lockup, your engine RPM will be at 3,500 RPM instead. And this is like immediately when you go off the brake, your engine RPM will jump up back again. So this is like way too wide of a range to actually start using it. And this happens like way too fast also to be able to uh, shift gears even with a sequential dog box. So the engine needs to be capable of operating at lower RPM also without like losing turbo speed or something like this. And our chassis dyno testing or <laughs> our customer chassis dyno testing so far shows that we can build uh, full boost pressure at at least 3,900 RPM, probably lower, but we haven't been able to uh, test that because of uh, yeah, some uh, teething issues with the drivetrain and dyno issues and stuff like this so far. Uh, but we can do that at, at uh, very low RPM, so, so that's very interesting. Um, what else do we have? So yeah, at lower RPM also, so as I showed you on the pumping losses stuff, we actually have the engine set up so that, so that we gain efficiency at lower RPM uh, with the pumping losses so we get a, a better scav scavenging efficiency which uh, lowers our, our knock amount so that we are able to run more boost pressure and more ignition at, advance at, at these uh, lower RPM areas. Uh, pumping losses of course will be much lower also because yeah, you have a lower engine RPM so there's more time for everything to happen. You have lower flow velocities so uh, less amount of pumping losses. This uh, huge sort of positive uh, power differential actually cr creates uh, positive pressure during the the um, the uh, pumping uh, sort of strokes, so so that is is very beneficial. Uh, what else was there? Yeah, so basically the uh, operating package of the engine is at least three thousand nine hundred RPM uh, to nine thousand five hundred RPM. So so very happy with that. And with the power band stuff, we start getting into sort of yeah anti lag operation also because I mean at 3,900 RPM uh, you have to wait for a long time for the engine to build boost with any kind of aid at all so so without anti-lag that would be a completely like unusable area you would probably without anti-lag your realistic minimum RPM would probably be about 5,000 5,500 RPM something like this and this is like way too high for uh, for use compared to where the uh, maximum power level is uh, but in addition to this, uh, we want also to talk about some advanced tuning options. So when we are looking at, at uh, compressor maps, so this is like for a 3000 horsepower turbo. I've deliberately selected this map here so they don't get confused. Like, is this actually the turbo we're using? This is not the turbo we're using on our, our FIA Rex car or uh, Rex engine. Uh, so when you're operating in this area of the map, so, so at a lower flow amount, uh, at some specific pressure ratio than than what the uh, when the, what the map works at. So so this is your your uh, surge area, and you will have an unstable uh, compressor compressor operation on the turbocharger in this area. So we'll have periodic backflow through the compressor. This will create a very uneven uh, pressure in your intake manifold. Your ECU will have big problems figuring out. Uh, like how much fuel to in inject to which cylinder on which stroke because the pressure is just fluctuate, fluctuating too quickly for that. And also this potentially will even damage your turbocharger and you will have more lag coming off of this. So it's very important to uh, not operate in this uh, surge area. So yeah, we have the... Uh, so with our restrictor set up, we want to uh, to uh, keep the anti-surge surge sort of uh, ducting on the compressor. This loses some efficiency from the compressor, but again, losing efficiency on the compressor compressor means uh, just yeah higher intake temperatures, which is not good, but not a cat cat catastrophe because we have a relatively uh, yeah high high or large option for uh, intercooler, and uh, needs slightly higher exhaust pressure. But yeah, we have, as you saw from the graphs, we have a very good uh, ratio there, so so not too concerned about losing like one or two percent efficiency by by keeping the uh, anti surge ducting operational. Uh, but uh, yeah, to get out of this area, so the anti-surge stuff basically allows us to run at this. Without the anti-surge stuff, the uh, surge limit will be would be much further over to the right, so so you would have uh, more problems there at a low RPM specifically. Uh, what else did I want to talk about? Um, yeah, so with um, blow-off valves or bypass valves, so uh, on this engine, for instance, they're not running a, a blow-off valve. I'm not even sure if it's legal to run or not with the FI rally cross rules. So yeah, not something that is on the car. The uh, bypass valve can be used to significantly help this, especially when we're in an area with a, with a high uh, positive pressure difference. That means you can flow a lot of air uh, through the bypass valve into the exhaust manifold. 
and all of this sort of increases the mass flow that we can get through and then get the operation point in, in the area that, that works on the compressor. Uh, this will of course uh, significantly increase your EGTs so depending on how advanced of an ECU you have, so if you have an ECU that is capable of doing dynamic situation compensations and will allow you to run a higher EG or like run short bursts sort of of uh, bypass valve opening at full power at low RPM, this will of course increase your EGTs very quickly. But if you're able to sort of dynamically allow this for like a few seconds or something like this in a critical situation in the race, then you can basically run that without a problem. So depending on your ECU, you might or might not be able to do that. Uh, then anti-lag stuff. So anti-lag will of course uh, allow you to run the engine down to the minimum RPM that you can maintain uh, full boost without... So both uh, making boost pressure, so getting enough power to your turbine section, and also not being in the surge area here. So, uh, so far with uh, testing, we've been able to to see from the data that we can already down at 3200 rpm uh, we have some some data points where we have significant boost pressure already and very good turbocharger rpm so it's in addition to reducing lag you can also increase your operating range and here it helps significantly so so while you're not at full throttle uh, you can run like uh, this like old school bypass valve type uh, set up to a uh, flow mass air mass uh, bypassing the uh, engine into the exhaust manifold and when your EGT start reaching some limit you can of course uh, introduce modern anti-lag so so uh, cylinder cuts there to uh, cool down the EGTs and uh, yeah allow you to operate for longer periods of time at, at that kind of setup so so you can also increase the sort of lower RPM range in addition to uh, reducing lag and uh, yeah, I would highly recommend our uh, yeah anti lag for dummies. I believe it was called um, yeah video on how to set this up and uh, recommendations for that and how that correlates with our engine. So so definitely recommend you guys to check that out. Um, launch control stuff. So definitely uh, we would yeah recommend uh, running a launch control setup uh, where you're basically running the engine at the minimum possible uh, RPM to build max uh, boost pressure. So in this case, we'd probably recommend somewhere around 4,500 RPM, maybe 5,000 RPM, something like this, to, to leave some kind of a margin there for, for the lower RPM range. And uh, yeah, then basically do sort of a, a clutch easing so that you're not spinning your wheels at all on the launch because you get su such a performance, a performance advantage of that type of a launch that it's definitely worthwhile to do. Uh, bypass valve use. Um, yeah, we, we are capable of running uh, bypass valve as, yeah, you, I mean, our uh, current Rex engine setup that the uh, customers have done is running a bypass valve, so so definitely possible, and it yeah, potentially can help with the uh, uh, with the sort of surge areas and stuff like this. So, so yeah, if you're allowed to, to do that, it doesn't hurt to have the setup to run it. But definitely, I mean, uh, running modern anti-lag is much more beneficial because then you can run the turbocharger at the sort of maximum target turbo speed and uh, boost pressures at all uh, to th through the uh, whole engine operation area so you basically can have the driver can have immediate throttle response and immediate full power as soon as he presses down on the pedal without having to spin up the turbocharger to actual max rpm which you uh, typically otherwise would have to wait for so you could maybe run the turbocharger to whatever 100,000 rpm but then your target RPM for the turbo might be 120 or 140,000 RPM and then you need to wait for the turbo to spool that last 40,000 RPM so with modern anti-lag you don't need to do that of course this again depends on uh, the uh, use case so if you have ECU guys that aren't comfortable setting up modern anti-lag then then yeah we definitely would, would recommend setting up an engine uh, for for bypass valve use only for instance and that will require a much smaller turbocharger um, and other sort of yeah compromises on the engine so all of these compromises reduce the maximum amount of power you can get out of this but again if you don't have capable enough guys to to do that then the overall car package will be faster uh, by running sort of a old school bypass valve system with with um, uh, no sort of modern anti-lag setup or something like this but again this is a, a compromise like like how fast do you want to have the car in relation to to how quick and easy it is to set up and and how sort of tricky it might seem to drive like with um, bypass valve, uh, valve setup only because you won't be able to run the turbo at maximum turbo rpm there will sort of be a, 
a sort of automatic power smoothing. So even if the driver immediately asks for full power, the engine power will sort of ramp in uh, over some period of time, so that it might be easier to drive without spinning the wheels, for instance. But it's definitely faster to run with, with uh, full power available at all times. It's just up to the driver to feed in the power according to traction and uh, track conditions. So that was the uh, yeah, basic go through on some of the numbers and some of the details on our Rex engine and why we've, we've designed some components as they are. And, and yeah, the performance values look very, very good. So, so uh, high power input uh, with the high compression ratio and able to run that at different RPMs. Uh, and uh, yeah, we should have uh, very low losses, which are more or less uh, yeah, confirmed from the data. So, so uh, good power potential. Uh, durability is also very good. This is again, um, just a bit of stuff directly off the drawing board with lots of guesses and question marks and stuff like this. But the, the data is extremely good on this. So very happy with that. And durability is also very good. So even with a hot uh, shutdown, so at like full uh, EGTs and everything like this on the track, they had a drivetrain component fail on the car and the driver got spooked by the by the really, really sort of loud rattling and everything. Like, oh no, the engine is about to explode or something and immediately shut down everything which, I mean, is kind of rolling the dice if the engine is going to take damage from that or not. Uh, but in this case, uh, it didn't take any damage. Uh, the danger here is, of course, when you have the exhaust manifold at whatever, 800, 900, 900 degrees or whatever that might be, like close to the cylinder head. Uh, all this heat without any uh, coolant flow at all is going to start boiling off the coolant very quickly. Once that is boiled off, then there's basically no more coolant and the uh, components are just going to start heat up depending on how much heat capacity they have in relation to uh, how much heat energy is in the, the sort of close areas in the exhaust manifold and also of course the exhaust valves, um, uh, exhaust ducting and stuff like this. But uh, yeah, it, it even held up for that on, on this one occasion at least, so very happy with that. And yeah, ready for sales basically. I'm Oscar from Elm Racing, see you guys in the next one, bye!